Okay, hi everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest today, uh, which is Stephanie Suchet. Um, she came to us, uh, to us from the uh, University of Ottawa, where she's a new faculty. It started uh, basically this summer. Uh, and she's going to tell us about how she incorporates uh, the AI and the own methods uh, into the work on uh, physical systems. So welcome, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you for the kind of introduction. And thanks especially for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, I think the last time I was at Montreal was like three years ago. So it was definitely pre-pandemic. So I'm very happy to be here today and talk a little about my research. I'm also happy that we have a lot of um, virtual participants to hi to you guys. Um, so today I will talk about my main um, interest of research which is about representing quantum states with artificial neural networks. And then in the end, I will also hopefully find some time to talk about or to introduce a very special um, interest of myself, uh, which is looking into so-called spiking neural networks. And I will tell you what all this is uh, within this talk. So I'm trying to keep it very basic and trying to give you a nice introduction to everything. So let me start with introducing the systems we are looking at. So I'm generally interested in qubit systems or quantum systems, um, which you might have heard about. Uh, qubits are generally the basic elements of quantum computers or quantum simulators. Um, so they are so-called quantum bits. So just the quantum analog of a classical bit, which is the basic element of our classical conventional computers. And so in this sense, qubits can take two states. We call them up or down. And there exist different ways how you can experimentally realize qubits. So, for example, you can look at a uh, single electron, which has an intrinsic spin, which can be uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. This generates an intrinsic angular momentum, which then points up or down. So, we can treat this as a qubit. Similarly, we can look at uh, photons and the polarization, which can be horizontal or vertical. Or we can also just look at single atoms in different energy levels, so for example, the ground state and an excited state. And we also have a two-state system, so we can treat it as a qubit. And I myself, I'm a theoretician, so I don't really care too much about how these can be realized experimentally, but I'm just assuming that we have some realization of a qubit, and I'm trying to study these uh, qubit systems. And now we introduce the Hilbert space, which is just the space of all possible uh, qubit states. And for a single qubit, our Hilbert space has two entries, right? So because our qubit can be up or down. And now if we look at two qubits, then our global space already has four in, uh, entries or four states, because now each qubit can be up or down, so we get four possible combinations. And now you can increase the system size further, we don't know where this is going. So if we look at a global state of n qubits, then our Hilbert space contains two to the n possible states. So the size of the Hilbert space scales exponentially with the system size. And this is what people call the curse of dimensionality, um, and this exponential scaling is a major problem in quantum mechanics because you all know that if we have a quantum mechanical system, then it is in a superposition of all these uh, possible states. So we have a superposition of exp exponentially many states. And if we want to describe the system exactly, we need to take all these exponentially many states into account. And so this is why it's called a curse of dimensionality. I personally think it's not directly a curse, it's a blessing in disguise. Because, of course, on the one hand, it's infeasible to simulate these qubit systems classically. So if they exist in a quantum system, but we don't have any approach to study them classically. But on the other hand, once we are able to control these qubit systems, we can make use of these uh, exponentially many states that exist in parallel. And this is what is done in quantum computing or quantum simulation. And now there are two ways how to approach uh, this problem. So on the one hand, we can use numerical methods to approximately simulate these uh, quantum or qubit systems um, uh, on a classical computer. There exist different ways how to do this. Uh, the most famous ones are tensor network states or ma uh, matrix product states. Uh, then we have quantum Monte Carlo methods. And recently, a very new topic is to use artificial neural networks to approximately simulate these quantum systems on a classical computer. So this is one way how to tackle these, these problems. So we just use a classical approximation and hope that we get enough knowledge from these classical approximations to better understand our qubit systems. On the other hand, we can also go for experiments. So we just experimentally realize our qubit systems 
then we don't need to uh, get a, a classical description, but we just have the actual quantum system. Um, but for this, we need to control our uh, experiment very well. So we need a very high controllability of our qubit system in order to be really able to use it. This is, again, this is what is done in quantum computation. So this is where quantum supremacy comes from. Um, but today I would like to focus more on this numerical part. So I will show you how we can uh, approximately simulate these quantum systems and hopefully gain more, um, more knowledge about them. And here we'll focus on this last part. So I will show you how we use artificial neural networks to simulate uh, quantum states. And so to summarize the outline of this talk, so I will start with talking about or introducing these qubit systems that we use for quantum computing. I will show you how we can relate them to artificial neural networks. Relate them in both ways. I will only talk about this direction. So I will show you how we can use artificial neural networks to simulate these um, quantum systems. And then towards the end of my talk, I will introduce another topic, which is so-called neuromorphic hardware, uh, which is basically um, an analog uh, or these analog chips that um, efficiently implement these artificial, artificial neural networks, or not directly these artificial neural networks, but slightly different uh, network architectures. Um, and this implementation on this analog hardware uh, is very fast, very energy efficient. These chips are very small. And so towards the end of my talk, I will also introduce this hardware and show you why it's promising to also study this hardware in connection with quantum computing. So let me start with talking about quantum state representation. Uh, so as said, I'm a theoretician. So I always assume a quantum computer to be just some black box. I know there's a lot going on in there. I never understand what's going on in there. But for me, I always assume it's some black box. The experimentalists can tune some knobs. And in the end, they can prepare some quantum state in this black box. And now I want to know whether the state that is prepared in there is actually the state that I asked for. And the only way I can access the state that is prepared is via projective measurements. So I can read out the qubit configuration of the prepared state. And when I measure once, I get this outcome. But this actually doesn't tell me anything about the prepared quantum state, right? Because our system is not in this state. It's in a superposition of states. And in order to fully describe the state that is prepared, I would need to perform infinitely many measurements, ideally also in exponentially many different bases. Um, but now, uh, every time I measure, our wave function collapses. So after every measurement, you also have to re-prepare the state. And so in the end, it's not possible to fully describe the uh, state that is prepared in our quantum system from this amount of measurements because you would need an infinite amount of measurements. And so the idea of quantum state representation is now to not get the exact uh, representation of the quantum state, but get an approximative classical approximate, uh, representation of the state just from a finite amount of measurements. And to show you uh, how we do this, I unfortunately have to introduce uh, all the math behind it, but I'm trying to keep it uh, very basic. So generally, we can express our quantum state in terms of our state vector, which we can then expand in terms of these basis states. So the basis states are just all possible configurations of each qubit being either up or down. And we sum over all basis states, and then each basis state gets weighted with this wave function amplitude, which is in general a complex number. And so once we have an expression for all these wave function amplitudes, we also have an expression for our state vector. So now the task is to find uh, these wave function amplitudes. And this we can do from measurements. So if we look at measuring some random observable O, then we can get its expectation value by sandwiching it with the state vector from the left and from the right. We can again expand our state vector in terms of the basis states. So we get this expression where we now sum over or some two times over an exponentially large amount of uh, basis states. So this is very inefficient, um, but we can specialize and focus on diagonal observables. So these are observables which only have diagonals, uh, entries on the diagonal of their um, matrix representation. And in this case, we get rid of one of these sums. So we only sum over the basis states once, then evaluate um, this, the observable at every, every basis state, and we weight each term with this wave function amplitude square. So now the wave function amplitude is a complex number, but if we square it, then it is actually real valued. It's non-negative. And if we assume that we normalize our wave function, then this is also uh, normalized, which means we can interpret the squared wave function as a probability distribution underlying the measurement outcomes of our diagonal observable. 
And so now the idea is that we determine our wave function amplitude from the measurement outcomes of our diagonal observable. And once we have done this, we can reconstruct our quantum state from these um, wave function amplitudes. Um, now, again, we don't want to find um, an expression for each uh, wave function amplitude, because then again, we would have exponentially many uh, values that we would need to store. But instead, we want to find a wave function answers which we can tune such that for any given basis state, it returns the corresponding wave function amplitude. Okay, so we just want to find some function which for a given basis state returns uh, the corresponding wave function amplitude. And we want to find this function from just a finite amount of measurements. And this is where our artificial neural networks come in. So now let me quickly introduce artificial neural networks. Um, I'm uh, introducing here the restricted Boltzmann machine, which is a so-called generative artificial neural network, meaning that uh, these networks can encode probability distributions, and then they also allow for efficient sampling from this encoded distribution. Uh, the restricted Boltzmann machine itself is a pretty simple and standard network. It consists of only two layers. So this is different from what you always hear in the news. You always hear about deep learning, where you have like a lot of different uh, neuron layers. Here we only have two. We have two kinds of neurons. So we have visible neurons, which we call V. These are binary variables. So each of these neurons just can take a state one or minus one. And then we have so-called hidden neurons, which are also similarly binary variables. The difference between these neurons is now that the visible neurons are the ones we actually have access to. So we can read them out or we can set them to specific values and we can introduce a physical interpretation to them. For the hidden neurons, we don't have any physical interpretation. Um, we do not read them out usually, uh, but they are just there and they are very essential because they tune the expressivity of the network. And what I'm meaning with this, you can see if you look at these connections between the neurons. So you see that between every visible and every hidden neuron, we have one connection, which is weighted with this connection weight W. And these Ws are variation parameters. So always when you hear about training a network, this means we, uh, yeah, we vary these variation parameters such that we achieve a, a target behavior of our neural network. And now you can see if we increase the number of hidden neurons, this means we increase the number of variation parameters. So we have more degrees of freedom and this increases the expressivity of our network. Okay, uh, what's very important in the restricted Boltzmann machine is that we don't have any connections within the different layers. So no connections between visible or between hidden neurons, but only between the neurons in the different layers. Now that we are given this um, network setup, we can introduce the network energy as just the negative sum over all connecting weights multiplied with the neurons it is connected to. And so again, the neurons are plus one or minus one, and our connecting weights just take any real valued number. And based on this network energy, we can introduce a Boltzmann distribution, which underlies all these neuron configurations, so just all configurations of the visible and the hidden neurons. And this is given by taking the exponential of the negative network energy, and then we normalize it with this partition sum, which is sum over all possible configurations of visible and hidden neuron, uh, visible and hidden neurons. Now we can go even a step further, and we can marginalize out these hidden neurons, meaning we take our Boltzmann distribution and we sum over all possible hidden neuron configurations, and what we get as an output is a probability distribution underlying only the visible neuron configurations. And now this is something we can work with because we said we can read out these neural uh, invisible neuron configurations. And so this is the probability distribution that we actually encode in our restricted Boltzmann machine. And so now I don't have time to show you this, but you just have to believe me that we can efficiently train our network to encode a target probability distribution underlying our uh, visible neuron configurations. And once we have done this, we are also able to efficiently draw samples of visible neural configurations from the encoded probability distribution. Okay, so generally the restricted Boltzmann machine is just an ansatz for a probability distribution that we can tune to encode a target behavior, and then we can generate data from it. So, so now, can I, can I add? So, sure. so basically what you're missing here is uh, phase information. You, you have probabilities. Yeah, I will come to this later. So this is just a general model of a restricted Boltzmann machine. So we only have probabilities in here. So this is a real valued model. 
Um, but yeah, you're on right to mention it. If we go to quantum states, we need to take the phase into account. And I will talk about this on the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so now we want to uh, use these restricted Boltzmann machines to simulate our quantum states. So basically what we do is we take our quantum state, we say, okay, we can uh, interpret this square wave function amplitude as a probability distribution underlying <coughs> our measurement outcomes. And now we know that our qubits are binary and we know that our neurons are binary. So the first thing we can do is we can rename our variables. So we call now our basis states just B. Then you see this is the same B as the vector of our visible neuron configurations. So what we did now is we uh, assigned each qubit with one visible neuron, neuron in the uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. And then this probability distribution just corres uh, yeah, corresponds to the probability distribution underlying the visible neurons. And so what we want to do in the end is we want to train the restricted Boltzmann machine such that the probability distribution underlying the visible neuron configurations approximates this probability distribution uh, given by the square wave function amplitude. Uh, we can train this RBM uh, without knowing the uh, explicit or without an explicit expression for the probability distribution, because we can just train it on a finite amount of data. So basically, we measure this observable multiple times. So we have a data set, and then we can train the RBM on this data set to approximate the underlying probability distribution. So this is why it is so efficient, because you don't need an actual expression. You only need some data sample from the target probability distribution. And yeah, as it was already mentioned, this only works um, if the uh, wave function amplitude is real valued, because as soon as we only consider the squared wave function amplitude, we always lose the phase information. And so we can use this approach in very specific cases, which are so-called uh, crowd states of stochastic Hamiltonians. Uh, stochastic Hamiltonians are defined as having only non-positive uh, yeah, non entries on the off-diagonal elements. And for these specific Hamiltonians, you can show that the ground state has only real valued amplitudes. So for ground states of stochastic Hamiltonians, we are fine. We can use this approach. It's all good. Uh, if we want to stay more general, then we need to modify our network architecture to include uh, the phase information. And there exist different works how to do this. Uh, I don't have time to talk about this now, but um, yeah, we will for, to, uh, for, today, for today, we will look at the stochastic Hamiltonians. Yeah. Can I ask, uh, what is the physical, like, so, I mean, broadly speaking, this is like one kind of variation. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. So, and there's other approaches, but I mean, so in some sense, you know, things like those based on tensor product states and so on may have a physical intuition that entangled with the physical limit, but what is the physical intuition telling me that this particular variational wave function is a good? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Can you repeat um, it? Oh, yeah, or... the question is so far, or, so this is basically variational uh, wave function ansatz. Um, it's a general ansatz, and this is just similar to like tensor network ansatz, um, where you, and, and for these tensor network ansatz, you know that um, like, you, know, you have the physical interpretation, so you know that they work for small entanglement, but you know that uh, computational costs scale exponentially for large entanglement. And so the question is if some similar interpretation is known for these uh, neural network quantum states. Uh, apparently, there's not. So, also, this field is pretty young, so people are still exploring it. Um, but generally, we don't know any physical observable which tells us whether this approach works well or not. Um, generally, what is known is that restricted Boltzmann machines can approximate any probability distribution with arbitrary precision. But the computational cost scales with the number of hidden neurons. So for some probability distributions, you might need a huge amount of hidden neurons. And then again, it doesn't scale well. Um, but yeah, so it has been shown that the entanglement is not um, the observable which limits this approach. But it is not clear what actually limits it. Yeah. So, so how do you know how many variables you need? Oh, you, you basically try it out. Yeah, it's just trial and error. So you start with some hidden neurons, you start increasing them, and at some point you see that it's not getting better anymore. And so you choose the kind of the minimum uh, amount of hidden neurons where you still have like a saturated uh, behavior. Okay. Then 
let's look at how we train the network. And I already mentioned this. So our approach to training is now that we take our quantum state, we measure the qubit configurations multiple times. So we generate this measurement set, which is a finite uh, measurement set, and it follows um, this probability distribution underlying the measurement outcomes. And now in the end, we train our network to approximate this probability distribution underlying the measurement data set with the distribution underlying our neural configurations. Uh, this is one way to train the network. Um, the training itself uh, is based, uh, is always based on minimizing some observable. So we, in this case, we look at the so-called Kullback Lifer divergence, which is kind of a measure for the distance between two probability distributions. And so in the end, we want to minimize this distance so that our two probability distributions are as close as possible to each other. So this is our optimization problem. So this is one way to train the network to reconstruct a quantum state from measurement data. Uh, another way, uh, since I said that we always train neural networks such that we minimize some observable, is we can look at ground states and we can just minimize the energy expectation value. So this is so-called Hamiltonian driven training, where we now want to find the ground state representation of some given, given Hamiltonian uh, by variationally minimizing the energy of the represented quantum state. And so what we do, we take our um, uh, uh, restricted Boltzmann machine as a wave function ansatz, and then we can evaluate the expectation value of our Hamiltonian. Um, you can introduce this local energy, which basically gives us the possibility to express this energy expectation value again as um, a weighted sum of this local energy, where each term gets weighted with this wave function amplitude squared. So it's again a probability distribution. And then you just want to minimize this energy expectation value, which then drives you to the ground state. And so this is the second kind of training algorithm that's used to represent quantum states, um, which is very different from the data-driven one, but also works very well uh, for ground state searches. And before I start talking about uh, results and how to apply this and how it performs, let me quickly introduce another uh, neural network architecture that um, yeah, we are now using more commonly, I think, which are so-called recurrent neural networks. And recurrent neural networks are generally very powerful for sequential data. So you probably all use recurrent neural networks daily. When you write a message on your phone, you know how your phone sometimes predicts you the next word. And the next word is always predicted, not only depending on the previous word, but on the sentence, like all the words that you were typing previously in the message. And so you have a sequence of words, and based on this sequence, we want to predict the next word. And this is exactly what recurrent neural networks are doing. So recurrent neural networks consist of such uh, neural network cells. Um, there's a lot going in there, they're also pretty uh, complex. Uh, I don't want to talk about the details, but the essential point is that in these network cells, we have hidden neurons, similarly to the uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, we can change the number of hidden neurons, and with this, we also change the number of variation parameters that we can tune inside the cell. Uh, now, what is essential for these recurrent neural networks is that the hidden neuron configuration is propagated over the input sequence. So every time we send a new input into our cell, we propagate the hidden sequence of the previous input. And this way, we generate a memory effect in our recurrent neural network. So this state still has some information about the input that was sent uh, to the network earlier. So this is why uh, recurrent neural networks work on sequential data. And now you see that we can send in these uh, different elements of the input sequence. We propagate our hidden state. And what we get as an output is a probability for the next element of the sequence. So from this probability distribution, we can sample the next input to our recurrent neural network. And uh, to make it a little more clear, so these probabilities that we get as an output are conditional probabilities. So it's always the probability of the next element conditioned on all previously sampled uh, elements in the or, or previous um, inputs to the network. And from this conditional probability, we sample the next uh, configuration or the next word in this case. And then we can get the probability distribution underlying or the probability for a given state or like underlying the full sequence uh, by just taking the product over all conditional probabilities. And now we can do this Similarly to our respective Boltzmann machines, we can use this um, to represent quantum states. 
because this is just another generated neural network, we can encode some probability distribution and we can uh, draw samples from this probability distribution. So again, you just have to believe me that this can be done efficiently. We can train the network to encode probability distribution, for example, underlying some data or also minimizing some energy expectation value. And then we can efficiently um, generate samples from this distribution. And so recurrent neural networks are another method how to reconstruct quantum states with artificial neural networks. And yeah, we now started using those more than we use, uh, or more often than we use uh, re restricted Boltzmann machines, mainly because they directly give us a normalized probability distribution as an output, which is very good. We don't need to normalize, so we don't need to uh, evaluate the partition uh, sum. Um, and also they have been shown to be a little more powerful uh, in their expressiveness. Can you uh, maybe just comment on, on the complexity of the algorithm? Like you changed architecture. Mm -hmm. How does it affect, I don't know, how many links do you have to, to fit or something like that? Oh, this is, yeah. That's a really tough question. So it's really hard to compare this. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever really compared like the number of variation parameters you need in one network or in the other network to do the same thing. Um, it's just, so inside this uh, RN answer, there are computations happening. So generally these networks are computationally much more expensive than the restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, so in general, I think they take longer, especially for small system sizes where you probably don't need too many hidden neurons in the restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, but at some point, when you go to large system sizes, your restricted Boltzmann machine is not expressive enough anymore, and then these are uh, quite more powerful. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, with current technology, how, how big of a system can you... Uh, with these? With these, can you work um, on? But it depends on the, on the system you look at. Of course, um, yeah. yeah, so maybe I can show you some results and then we can come sure. back to this question. Yeah. Okay. Good. So the results I will talk about now um, are on so-called grid back atom arrays. So this is all based on a recent work I published uh, together with Skyler Morse and Vijay Mirali, who are uh, uh, PhD students at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Matthew Radzinowski is a PhD student at MIT, I think, and probably many of you know Roger Malko who is at the University of Waterloo. So he was my postdoc supervisor and he's running the pickle and he kind of coordinated um, the entire uh, project. So we look at these Rootback Atom arrays, which are one way or one of the three ways I introduced in the beginning to realize qubit systems. So these are just neutral atoms that we uh, can prepare in two different energy levels. So either in the ground state or in an excited or so-called Rootback state. We can arrange these atoms on a lattice, for example, the square lattice, and then we can read out the uh, atom configurations or qubit configurations um, of each atom. Now, these systems are described by the so-called uh, Rippback Hamiltonian. This looks a little complicated, but actually it's not too much happening there. So we have these two terms, which are created by some laser driving, and these um, address each atom individually. So we have our off the angular term, which just drives each uh, atom between the ground and the excited state with a Rabi frequency omega. And then we have a heat tuning term. So this delta basically heat tunes the um, excited state or the energy level of the excited state. And with this can influence how probable it is that, in, um, that in one atom goes into the excited state. Then we have this interaction term, uh, which is basically a Van der Waals interaction. And Again, the math looks a little complicated. The way it works in the end, or the way you can imagine it, is you can introduce such a ripback radius, and now any uh, two excitations within the ripback radius are penalized. So basically, we see that this atom is in the excited state, and so any other excitation within this radius will be penalized. So these are all in the ground state. And then this interaction uh, decays with um, the distance to the power to the six. So we have a rapidly uh, de de decreasing uh, interaction between the atoms. And the reason why we look at this system is that people have shown numerically and also experimentally that you can, by just tuning these uh, parameters in the Hamiltonian, you can realize a lot of very interested uh, phases of matter. 
with also a lot of very interesting quantum phase transition between it. Um, these systems are very well controlled in experimental realizations, which is why they are yeah, promising candidates for high quality quantum computation and quantum simulation. And so people are really interested in studying these systems. Uh, but numerical methods are actually pretty limited uh, for these systems, which is why we try to approach them with these uh, neural network concepts. And so we started with um, yeah, reconstructing our quantum state on measurement data. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have access to a real experimental data, um, but we had Ejaz who was writing a quantum Monte Carlo code simulating these uh, Rydberg atom arrays. And with this quantum Monte Carlo code, we were able to generate um, measurement data. So we generated 10 to the 5 measurements from the ground state of our Rydberg system for some um, chosen parameters. And we also use this measurement data to estimate the um, kind of exact energy. We don't know how exact it really is, but this is what we assume as the, the target energy that our network should reach. And so we started with training the network on this measurement data. So we have 10 to the 5 measurement outcomes. We train our network to approximate the underlying probability distribution. And we use this recurrent neural network. And now we are plotting the energy difference. So it's just the difference between the energy of the state encoded in the neural network and the energy we get from our quantum Monte Carlo code. And we plot it as a function of the number of hidden neurons in our network. Uh, the different colors are different. We go from 4 by 4 to 16 by 16. And you see that if we increase the number of hidden neurons, then our accuracy, our difference in energy gets smaller. So this is what we expect, right? If we increase the number of hidden neurons, we increase the network expressivity. So we expect higher accuracies. So this looks all very well. And now we want to find the sweet spot where we do not have too many hidden neurons. So the computational cost is not too high. But at the same time, we want to get a high accuracy. And so here we decided that if we just choose twice as many uh, hidden neurons as the one dimensional or yeah, the one dimensional size of the uh, atom array, then we are at a pretty satisfying um, uh, accuracy for all system sizes and the computational cost is still kind of okay. And so we focused on these uh, NH equals 2L um, in the following. But now we have trained our network on 10 to the 5 measurements. This is actually quite a lot. So we were able to generate this numerically Experimentally, as I mentioned in the beginning, if we measure, we have to re-prepare our state after each measurement. Um, this is actually the bottleneck of these Rydberg atom arrays. So re-preparing the state because then the atoms need to be arranged exactly on the lattice. This takes so much time that we can never um, generate 10 to the 5 measurements in a feasible amount of uh, run time. And so we said, well, what happens if we have the best samples? And so we just sampled or we just chose uh, 10 to the 3 random uh, samples from our full measurement data set. And we trained our network on this limited amount of data, which is yeah, experimentally more realistic. And here we now look at a system of 16 by 16 atoms. And we plot the energy of the state encoded in the network as a function of the training iterations. Okay, So at each point here, we can uh, make more an update on the variation parameters in the network. Uh, again, the different colors are different numbers of hidden neurons. And what you see now is, so this black dash line is the uh, estimated energy from the quantum Monte Carlo. And what you see is that we start far away from the, uh, from the correct energy, which makes sense because we initialize our network randomly. Then we start training, we run towards this estimated energy. And at some point we start running away from the energy again. And this is a very well-known phenomenon in machine learning. This is so-called overfitting. So we only have a small data set. We train our network on this small data set and it just gets too closely adapted to this data set, so it doesn't generalize anymore. And well, in this case, it just runs away from the estimated energy because it's just too close to um, the data set. And so what we concluded from these results is, well, we cannot really train our neural network on experimental data because we cannot produce enough data to get uh, or to avoid this overfitting behavior. So, so that's, sorry, yeah. does, does that not just suggest that maybe you're maybe in a sense too aggressive or something. Um, like you're trying to find a very good fit with the first kind of 500 samples. You get stuck uh, in some local minima and you kind of escape from, I, I mean, I'm not, yeah. I, I don't understand this enough, like yeah. how it works, but like it just seems like having more samples should not be a problem. 
No, so, so the question is, uh, this is really a problem of having not enough samples or whether it is rather a problem of getting stuck in a local minimum yeah. that we cannot escape from. Um, actually, this is not a problem of being stuck in a local minimum because we saw, see here that well, we can do better if we have enough data. Mm -hmm. And we already used the, like, the optimal optimization uh, algorithm here. And it should not get stuck in a local minimum. And especially even if you're stuck in a local minimum, you should saturate, right? You should stay there and then the energy shouldn't go up. So this is definitely a fact um, coming from this finite amount of measurements. Yeah. And if you just kept adding more measurements, then you would go into the, sorry, so am I getting it right? So with 10 to the three samples, you get that bit, with 10 to the five, you get weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah, so generally we could add more measurement data during the training process, but then again, it's experimentally not realistic to get more data. So we are really limited to this. And since we want to get more insights into the experimentally realizable states, this approach obviously doesn't help because just from this finite amount of measurements, we cannot really reconstruct the state. Okay, good. So having seen this yeah, very disappointing result, we said, well, what happens if we use this other training algorithm that I introduced to really minimize the energy expectation value? So again, we start with our uh, Rydberg atom array. We fix our Hamiltonian parameters to the same values as before. And now we want to minimize this uh, local energy of our recurrent neural network. Um, and so we start training the network and what we get is such a behavior. So again, we are plotting this energy expectation value of the state encoded in the recurrent neural network as a function of the training iterations. Now uh, we fix the number of hidden neurons to two times L that we saw earlier that it works well. And we have different system sizes. And now the dash lines are always the estimated energies for the corresponding system size. And we see that we are not really getting close to the estimated energies. So this is not a very uh, promising result. But on the other hand, you see that we have a new parameter here. So if we um, evaluate our uh, energy encoded in our recurrent neural network, then we do this by evaluating this local energy that I talked about in the beginning um, on samples that we have drawn from the recurrent neural network. And so we have a number uh, where we can tune how many samples we draw from the recurrent neural network. So we chose a thousand samples here, but maybe that's not enough. So maybe it's, this is just a bad estimate of the energy. If we have a bad estimate of the energy, this totally affects our training because we optimize the value we, get, uh, we, we evaluate on this finite number of samples, right? And so the first thing to do was to just tune this number of samples that we draw from the recurrent neural network. And so now we have the energy difference again um, for the different system sizes, and we plot it as a function of ns. And what you see is, well, it does worse in the beginning. So if we have very small uh, amounts of samples, then it definitely does perform worse. But for 1,000 samples, we are pretty much converged. So it doesn't really help if we increase the number of samples here. Uh, but at the same time, if we look at the results we saw earlier when we trained on this uh, full amount of data that we have, then we saw that so we have to compare it to this point where we have um, an h equals 2l. And you see that the accuracy is much better than what we reach uh, in this example, right? And so this tells us now that actually the network expressivity is not the bottleneck here because we see that the network can encode this uh, state with a higher accuracy, but we somehow just don't find the state. And so, our results are rather limited by convergence times. So we assume that if we run this network or this training uh, for longer times, then at some point we would get closer to the estimated energy. But at the same time, this is computationally so expensive that we could not run it long longer. Yeah. Uh, Sorry? How much? Oh yeah, so the question is about um, yeah, the computational costs of these algorithms, um, especially when we go to 16 by 16, um, I think to get these results, we probably let it run for like a week or one and a half weeks or something. Yeah, on a single CPU, yeah. 
So we, yeah, we did not implement this code uh, on GPUs yet. So this is also a factor where we could definitely go faster. Um, but generally, I mean, this gives us some speed up, but it's still very limited, right? Yeah, so this was run on Compute Canada, um, but it was still on a single CPU only. So it was not parallelized yet. Um, yeah, but instead of like working on our implementation, we thought, well, what if we work on the algorithm itself? And we came up with this nice plot, which I will uh, introduce in detail now. So again, we are looking at a 16 by 16 atom array. You're looking, or you're plotting the uh, energy of our state encoded in the recurrent neural network as a function of the training iterations. And we have the estimated energy uh, or the target energy in black uh, down here. And now, so first of all, we have this blue line uh, up here. So this is just um, our variational training. So this is the Hamiltonian driven training. Here we only minimize the energy of the state encoded in the recurrent neural network. And you see that well, it goes down somehow, but it does not really get close to the target solution. Uh, in orange, we have another curve that we have seen before. Uh, this is the data-driven reconstruction where we have this finite amount of measurement data. You see it goes down in the beginning. At some point, it starts overfitting, so it goes up again. And so these were the problems that we had seen earlier. And now we said, well, what happens if we combine the two training approaches? And this in green here. So what we do in green, we always start with data driven training. This is why all the green uh, dots overlap with the orange ones for short training times. And then at different, uh, uh, after different numbers of training iterations, we switch from data driven to Hamiltonian driven training. And these are the different shades of uh, green here. So we just switch between the two different um, training algorithms at different uh, times. And what you see is that every time we switch, we jump down really close to the uh, target estimated uh, energy, and we get much closer than both of our uh, previous uh, simulation methods. Um, we also see that, or we see it here in the inset, we see that all green solutions at late times um, go below the threshold of 0.015 um, to the uh, uh, distance from the um, estimated energy. And so we started with introducing um, a convergence time. So we just say, okay, the convergence time is the number of training iterations it takes um, to cross this uh, threshold of 0.015 above the estimated energy. And now we plot the convergence time as a function of the um, transition time, which is just the number of training iterations we use um, on data-driven training before we switch to uh, Hamiltonian-driven training. And here we are plotting these convergence times. And you see, so if we have a convergence time of uh, a transition time of zero, this is just the Hamiltonian driven training. We don't do any data driven in, uh, before this. And you see that it takes more than 6,000 uh, iterations to get below this flat threshold. So you see, we didn't run it long enough here. If we run it longer, then we go below this threshold. But at the same time, you see that all green dots are way lower. So they have way shorter convergence times. Uh, we find the optimum for about 800, which is actually interesting because 800 is exactly where the overfitting starts. So ideally, we can switch between the two training algorithms at the point where the overfitting starts. But generally, you see, no matter where we switch between the uh, two training algorithms, we always get an immense uh, speed up in the convergence time. And so independent of where we switch, as long as we switch between the two algorithms, we definitely get, uh, or we can significantly reduce the convergence time of our network. And so we found here that we can kind of use a limited amount of uh, experimental data to pre-train our network and give it some, yeah, some uh, advance in then finding, or for then finding the uh, ground state with variation energy minimization. And so this was a very interesting result. It was really impressive to see that yeah, we can pre-initialize our network and give it some, some speed up um, just by using some finite amount of measurement data. And again, this was only numerical data. So as a next step, it would be interesting to see how experimental data can help there, where we have additional noise effects, right? So it's not as ideal as our quantum Monte Carlo data, uh, but it would be interesting to see if we can still get any benefits out of this. Okay, so this was... Um, the first part of my talk, so now I will keep the second part very so short, I guess. <laughs> Pretty much running out of time already. Yeah. Can I just maybe ask 
what exactly? I mean, in practice, what do you do when you do the Hamiltonian training? Uh, you change the Hamiltonian? Or, I guess I didn't understand exactly how you do the Hamiltonian training. For the Hamiltonian training? So you always you evaluate the energy expectation value of your Hamiltonian during the training, and you update your network parameters such that this energy expectation value gets minimized. Right. And so this, in the end, the minimum energy is always reached for the ground state. So in the end, you should converge to the ground state by right? just updating your network like this. Yeah. Do you characterize those uh, wave functions uh, by anything other than just the energy? Because maybe you don't yeah. go to the correct energy, but if you do data driven training, maybe you get the correct order parameters. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. So the question is if we only look at the energy and we only use the energy to characterize uh, the results. Um, in this case, yes, um, but yeah, generally you could see if even if the energy is not optimal, maybe your correlations or your order parameters are already there. Um, but yeah, we didn't look at this in this point here yeah. because generally if you have a good energy, then all the other um, observables should also be good. Okay. Good. Then let me quickly talk about neuromorphic computing. Uh, so we have seen, the, seen these artificial neural networks and the name suggests that initially they have been inspired by the biological brain and the behavior of the brain. Um, but over time, actually, these artificial neural networks have evolved pretty far away from the behavior of a biological brain. This is good because they have been developed with the goal of optimizing their performance on conventional computers. So this is why we can use them now. But on the other hand, we lose quite a lot of really nice um, properties of biological brains, which are uh, extremely fast, very energy efficient. And if you think about how many neurons you have in your brain, they are also extremely small, especially compared to the computation clusters that we run our neural uh, or artificial neural networks on. And so one big field people are looking into is to kind of closing this gap between the two um, setups again. So people are developing these neuromorphic devices, which kind of yeah, try to run uh, artificial intelligence with the benefits of biological brains. And they exist different kinds of neuromorphic devices. This is uh, an example of the BrainScales um, hardware that is developed at the, uh, at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. And this is really developed with the motivation to emulate a human brain. So this is pretty close to the human brain behavior. Um, but on the other hand, I will show you this in the next slides, the behavior of these uh, spiking neuromorphic chips is pretty far away from artificial neural networks. So we cannot just take these algorithms and run them on this hardware because it's just a totally different behavior. Uh, another example are these vector matrix multiplication accelerators. So this is an example of a chip that is developed in Sherbrooke at the 3IT by Dominic Poir. And they are closer to uh, artificial neural networks because the vector matrix multiplication is the basic operation of artificial neural networks. Um, but on the other hand, they are further away from these biological brains. Okay, so we can run any uh, artificial neural network efficiently on these analog um, devices, but yeah, we don't get all the benefits of our uh, biological brain. And so the reason why I'm so excited about um, all these devices is that, as I've shown you, artificial neural networks find quite a lot of applications in quantum technologies. I've shown you one example, there exists way more. And so I'm interested in figuring out if we can get any more benefits from using these uh, neuromorphic hardware in the field of quantum technologies, where on the one hand, since these chips are very small and very energy efficient, they could be integrated in the experiment. But on the other hand, I told you we need new algorithms to run on these spiking neuromorphic chips. And maybe we can, with these new algorithms, also overcome the mutations of our artificial neural network algorithms. Uh, so let me quickly introduce these spiking neurons um, that are the basic elements of the spiking neuromorphic hardware. Uh, they are quite different from the artificial neural network, uh, the artificial neurons I just talked about. Uh, but basically, they are also connected to other neurons in the network. And so they have an incoming synapse where they receive signals from other neurons, they have an outgoing synapse where they can send signals to other neurons. And the basic element of this uh, spiking neuron is a membrane on which a potential is applied. And this potential evolves some time, and the time evolution uh, is driven by the signals the neuron receives on the incoming synapse, so just by signals sent out from connected neurons. And whenever this potential crosses a threshold, it's indicated in red here, the neuron spikes. And this means that the membrane potential is set to some refractory value, 
So during this time, the uh, neuron cannot cycle again. And at the same time, the neuron sends out the signal on the outgoing synapse. And with this, it influences the membrane potential of all connected neurons. And different to um, these artificial neuron, neural networks that we have seen, uh, we don't have a layered structure here because your brain also doesn't have a layered structure of neurons, but we just have random all to all connections in these uh, spiking neural networks. And so this is then the network structure again. So you see we have these random uh, uh, connections, um, but these connections are also uh, weighted just similarly to the artificial neural networks. And so we can also train our network by just changing these weights of the connections between the neurons. And with this, we can tune how much one uh, signal sent out by a neuron influences the connected neuron side. And so back at Heidelberg University, where I did my PhD, we wanted to use this chip that is developed there to represent quantum states. And so what we did is we, or what we wanted to do is we wanted to use these spiking neuromorphic, uh, these spiking uh, neurons to kind of simulate a restricted Boltzmann machine. So we wanted to use it as a generative network and we encode a probability distribution and we generate samples from it. And in order to do so, what we needed first is some binary interpretation. So we said, okay, we have two states of our neuron Either it is refractory, so it is in this state where it has just spiked and it cannot spike again, or it is non refractory, so the potential is moving freely, it can spike at any point in time. And then we can read out neuron configurations at different points in time, which we can interpret as something from a probability distribution. But so far, our model has been uh, purely deterministic. And so, in order to really sample from a probability distribution, we also added a set of noise neurons, which just spike at random points in time. And with this, give us some probabilistic behavior of our neural configurations. And actually it has been shown mathematically that this network setup or this interpretation of all neurons um, approximates the behavior of a restricted Boltzmann machine. We have seen earlier, we can use restricted Boltzmann machines to uh, reconstruct quantum states. And so this is exactly what we did in Heidelberg. So we took this spiking neuromorphic hardware we interpreted some of our uh, spiking neurons as visible neurons in the RBM. We interpreted others as hidden neurons in the RBM. Then we set the connections accordingly. So we set all connections between these neurons to zero. And we only were able to tune connections between hidden and visible neurons. And then at different points in time, we were reading out the visible neuron configurations. And just by reading them out at different points in time, we generated such a histogram. And now we used uh, so-called positive operator value measures um, to interpret our histogram as a quantum state. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into details here. Basically what these POVMs do is they give us a unique representation of a quantum state in terms of a probability distribution. And so we don't need to care about the complex phase here because we can encode everything just in a probability distribution and we can train our spiking neuromorphic chip to um, encode this probability distribution. And so that's what we did. And now we trained our RBM. Uh, we started very simple with just reconstructing a bell state, which is a two qubit state. And it is strongly entangled. So it's just the equals of the position of the up, up, and down, down state. And uh, this state is strongly entangled. And so we wanted to see if we can reconstruct the state on the hardware. And if we can do so, we, we were especially interested in seeing if we can capture the entanglement. And to see this, we chose this measurement setup. So we basically send our, or we send each qubit to one of two parties. Each party randomly chose one of two possible measurements of the qubit, and these measurements or bases are related to an angle theta. And then in the end, we compare or we look at the uh, correlation between the measurement outcomes as a function of theta. And in terms of these correlations, you can introduce the spell observable, which on the one hand has an upper limit of two times square root of two. But the interesting point is that it also has a classical limit, which means as soon as we cross this classical limit of two, we know that we have quantum entanglement present in our belt state. And so we trained our uh, spiking neuromorphic chip to reconstruct this belt state, and we evaluated the bell observable as a function of this angle theta. Now you see this black line, so this is the exact solution, this is what we aim for, and you see these red data points, and this is really me running the spiking neuromorphic chip, reading out these uh, measurement data, and this is at a late uh, stage of training, and you see that it works totally fine. So we really capture exactly the uh, behavior of a belt state. And we also get into this quantum regime in gray here. So we definitely capture the quantum entanglement. 
And this was a really amazing result to see that we have quantum entanglement present on such an analog spike in neuromorphic chip. Uh, you also see that we can um, reconstruct noisy cloud states where we don't have entanglement anymore. And you see that the training process just looks perfect. So we start far away and we rapidly converge towards the exact uh, solution. So training the network works really nice. And now two qubits are kind of boring. So we say, well, let's go to larger system sizes. And we looked at the green dagger horn signing state, which is the equal superposition of the all up and the all down state for more than two qubits. And we trained our network on these states um, and evaluated the fidelity between our target state and the reconstructed state in the spiking neuromorphic hardware. And here you see the outcome. So we plot the fidelity as a function of the number of hidden neurons in the network. For n equals two, we have our well state. So this works very well. But if we increase the system size, you see that the fidelity is much less. And you see that it kind of increases with the systems, uh, with the number of hidden neurons as expected, but it's not very satisfying. And here we stopped at slightly less than 16 neurons. Uh, we didn't stop there because we were satisfied, but we were using all neurons on the spiking neuromorphic chip. So we could not choose more hidden neurons because there were no more neurons present. And so the representable system sizes um, of our qubits are uh, very limited by the size of the neuromorphic hardware. Uh, we asked the neuromorphic hardware developers if they can create uh, larger chips. Actually, it's not that easy. And so instead, uh, my approach in the near future is to work on the, uh, on the software side. And so I'm hoping to find algorithms that are more suitable for this spiking neuromorphic um, and allow us to go to larger system sizes. Uh, yeah, this brings me to the end of my talk. So as a summary, I've shown you how we can use artificial neural networks to reconstruct quantum states. Uh, I have shown you that it's very promising to give us new um, insights into qubit systems. And I've also shown you how we can um, use spiking neuromorphic hardware for this. And yeah, uh, now I'm in Ottawa. I'm running the group, which is called Apricot. And I'm hoping to keep on working on these spiking neuromorphic chips uh, to represent quantum states. And since I'm new, uh, I have a lot of positions available. So if you're a student and this interests you, uh, feel free to reach out and talk to me about this. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I'm happy thank to you. <laughs>